I think some of where it comes from is, um, is the experience that I'm here to share with you tonight, which is essentially being bullied. Um, I was bullied because I've, I've always been gay, I was born gay, and I guess that was something that people picked up off me from a very young age. Um, my mother, who is here tonight, and I'm very grateful for her being here, I think she's more nervous than me in hearing to write my story tonight, told me that she knew that I was gay when I was three, and when I went to school, I think everybody knew then, and they wouldn't let me forget it. Um, and really, I suppose the roots of what I'm talking about today is in relation to homophobia and how Ireland treats its LGBT citizens. Um, so where did the bullying start? The bullying started on my first day of school and what started as, I suppose, being recognised as girlish um, then transformed into, you know, being called pansy, to puff, to fag, to homo and then where that went to later on in life where was kind of, you know, as I've written in my notes that I'm not referring to anymore, was, was words I wouldn't use in a church. I'd written them down initially and I was like, oh God, I can't say that. Cast out. Um, so, for me, bullying is something that's in the media a lot lately and belong to a, an LGBT organisation, do a lot on, on uh, homophobic and transphobic bullying. And really, I've gone on such a journey to be here today because part of, part of the journey was I hid my story for, for years and years and years. I never shared it with anybody. And I I suppose the people I kept it from most were my family, so uh, this is my first time sharing my story tonight. Um, <laughs> for a start, I'd, I think that bullying is a term that um, is definitely overused in our society. We talk about it in the business world and in every world, and, and for me it's just, it, it's kind of lost it's lost its. It's okay to throw. <laughs> <laughs> it's lost its power and its impact. And and my first-hand experience is that bullying does ruin lives, and it takes years away from people, and it takes years to rebuild that time back. Um, as I said, my mum and sister are here, and they've been just amazing on that journey, and I probably wouldn't be here and brave enough to speak about it. But anyway, as I said where the bullying started was being called, you know, girl, pansy, gay, and then it was in secondary, really, that it turned into fag, puff, fairy, and homo. Um, and what I'd ask you to remember as I talk about my bullying um, is that where I went to school was where I lived. So the bullying that I experienced was from the ages of four to 17, and it was day in and day out, nonstop, um, walking to school, walking home from school, in school, you know, and I should add that the teachers in my primary school did absolutely nothing. Thankfully those issues are being addressed and I'm an absolutely wonderful teacher in secondary who, again, because I never raised my voice because I was so full of shame about why I was being bullied and, and kept silent on it, they silently did some work in the background and, and made my life a little easier from the ages of 12 on. And then since Cathy and Claire asked me to speak at Rites of Passage, I've been going on somewhat of a journey in terms of, you know, thinking about what, what happened to me as a child. And some of those, those emotions and, and experiences I buried deep, deep, deep within me and never wanted to think about again. But when I was thinking about all these children who were, you know, pretty awful to me, there was adults did it as well. And I clearly remember walking up and down my road on certain occasions and you know, maybe we were being awful on the road and, and various things like that, but neighbours, my parents' neighbours would say, are you a big girl or you're nothing but this and you're nothing but that, and when I thought about it now, God, if someone did that to my nephew, I'd absolutely reef them out of it, like I just wouldn't stand for it, because adults are protectors and they shouldn't engage in the homophobia that was rampant then, that's I, that's I suppose what I thought, but the reality is, where does homophobia come from? Where did the homophobia that the children who tormented me day to day for 13 years, where did they pick that up from? And to me, it's a pretty obvious place it was from the adults that at that time I felt should protect me. I'm not gonna talk about um, incidents of bullying much. Uh, the one thing I'd say it was it was mainly verbal and on occasional physical and a lot physically intimidating, mainly because I was a small kid and. 
I went to school quite young, I just turned four, and most people in my school were that little bit older. The worst memory I have was um, being in secondary school, and I was about 12 or 13, and I went to look for my bag post-lunch, I'd put it down somewhere, as you do. I couldn't find it at, at all, you know, and I started to get panicked. I knew that somebody had moved it and was a prank or whatever, but it definitely wasn't a prank. Someone in my class was like, oh look, somebody threw it into the loo, but they hadn't just threw the bag into the loo, they'd emptied the books all around the, in the toilet, outside the toilet, and, and had pissed all over all my books and all my copy books and everything like that. But again, like I said, such was my shame at the time, sure I didn't tell anybody, and I just decided to keep that to myself even, and I just remember being in a blind state of panic that somebody would do that. Another experience was, um, and this is just to show how, how bullying does um, stay with you no matter where you are, is, um, again, I was a teen at some stage and I was walking my gran up to mass in our, in our area. And I was absolutely in a blind state of panic that someone would call me fag with my grandmother. Because I idolized these, this woman. She was just amazing. Um, really, really strong woman. Um, and yet, that stayed with me, even at that stage, even when there was no one on the road to call me fag. So I guess why am I here sharing this story? Well, recently, um, I have a wonderful troop of friends with me tonight who've been amazingly supportive, but I was talking to Aoife at home one night, and we we're talking about our childhood experiences. And like I said, I, I didn't share with, with anybody. I'd kept this very deep down for years, and I kind of alluded to being bullying at certain stages. So we're talking, you know, and I was like, well, this happened to me, and that happened to me. And she was absolutely shocked, and I was kind of, I was shocked that she was shocked because A, I was like, did she really not know her? And then I was like, oh, maybe, I don't know, whatever, you know? And she was like, why didn't your parents do anything? Why didn't they take you out of school? Why didn't they, you know, help you in some way? And literally really calmly, rather than get annoyed that she was, you know, questioning how my parents raised me, I was like, well, I never told them. And it was at that stage that I realized even, and this is this year, I should add, that even at this stage in my life, I'd never elaborated on what had happened to me and how it had affected me as well. So, so that's why I'm here, really, because I realized the, the pain that, that went with it. I have written here, I'm, I'm not looking at my notes, but I'd, uh, <laughs> I better refer to this line. It sounds good. I, I brushed it up as a kind of growing pain, but it was far more than a growing pain, because pain comes and goes. But emotional scars last a very, very long time, and sometimes forever. And I have had really carry that pain with me for a long time while projecting this image that that was happy like if you asked anybody about me as a child a teen or anybody of my friends who were in college i'm permanently happy and laughing and part of that was to hide what was experiencing what i was experiencing as a child so in 1981 which was the year i started school being gay was and still is among certain individuals and groups a heinous sinful and evil act my treatment in school was just the way young boys picked up, assimilated, and expressed the rampant homophobia present in society. Homosexuality was a criminal offence between men. In the 1980s, men and women and transgender people, and those who hadn't left for England or America, were beaten, mutilated, and murdered across Ireland. It's really part of our recent history that isn't terribly documented. The justice system did absolutely nothing to improve the standing of these people. Declan Flynn was one of these men who I've come across um, in the, the gay history books from time to time. And the reason he's such an important figure was he's part of kind of the collective of where Pride came from because he was murdered in Fairview in 1983. And when the men that were brought to, well, brought to justice, the men who went to court over it, oh God. Um, <laughs> when they went to court over it, their, their sentences were overturned. They served absolutely no prison time. And that was because there was no, there was nothing, no respect for gay men then. Legislation didn't protect us. Uh, it, it actually worked against us. So I'm gonna have to skip loads now. Um, so just give us one sec. Yeah, so this was the society I was growing up in, and it's no wonder I was gay if I went to school in 1981 and then in 1983, you know, a, a man was murdered. Like I said, all these boys just assimilated all, this, all these feelings that came from their parents. But 
Thankfully, from 1993, legislation was introduced which decriminalised homosexuality in Ireland. And from there, a lot of other legislation, there was employment legislation, so on and so forth. Um, there was recently civil partnership. And legislation really, really, really does help. Um, the decriminalisation especially, um, it just started to put gay men, because that's what the law dealt with, on, on a different footing. But really what we're looking at is, is where has the legislation helped lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people now? And it has helped. But what I'm asking for you now is to help bring it on a little bit further. You see, it's not just the legislation, it's, it's the national consciousness that needs to change. And until that happens, and until every single person in this room not just changes their own consciousness, but helps to change somebody else's. So if you hear of a, a kid like I used to be being bullied on the street or someone saying fag or puff or fairy, if you hear, hear it being said to somebody on the street, walking away is helping to change nothing. Walking away endorses what's being done to that person and it will perpetuate the homophobia that's been rampant in Ireland for centuries. So where to go for now? Like I said, change the national consciousness. We have a referendum coming up. Can I talk for just a minute more? <laughs> just have to check with the leader. Um, there's a referendum coming up on marriage equality. We hope sometime soon. Um, I'm the, the acting director of an organization who's campaigning for equal marriage rights for same-sex couples in Ireland, so I do have a vested interest. But when I think about it, rites of passage are so important in our lives. There are times when we, you know, we just, come into our own and we shine. And LGBT, LGBT people are denied that on a daily basis. You know, even coming out sometimes it has to be done in secrecy, but marriage, which a lot of people would see as a hugely important rite of passage, is denied to us. And it's bad enough that we have to ask you to vote on it. And I'm asking you to vote yes if it ever happens, but imagine how that would make you feel and you know what some people call your lifestyle, it's, it's not very good. And then, Another thing that happens is our right of passage of parents. Nobody can vote on that, but it's constantly debated in the media and it bugs the shit out of me because there are amazing parents who happen to be gay, who cares? And there's people in the media who constantly question, should they be parents? Well, they absolutely should be parents. They're incredible people. So, I suppose I better finish up with a lot of <laughs> So where to go from now? I'd just say I'll, I'll finish on my words and I better take a sip of water from this. <laughs> until the national consciousness in Ireland evolves and until LGBT people living in Ireland are unconditionally equal, the bullying will continue unabated. My love is not a love that dare not speak its name. It's a love like any other and it's a rite of passage. I'm entitled to, without judgment, without prejudice, without hate, and definitely without bullying. There's a religious line about homosexuality that says, forgive the sinner, but not the sin. Well, I say forgive the homophobe, but not homophobia. Homophobia kills, it mutilates, it mentally scars people. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot, dr darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So with those amazing words of wisdom, I just say to you, if you do encounter homophobia at any level, be it small or large, encounter it with love and light. And just, all you have to say is, excuse me, that's not a cool thing to say. I heard it very recently done brilliantly. Somebody was asked to sign a petition for um, something I was working down at Electric Picnic. Um, and one of the guys was like, oh, people are going to think we're fags. And one of the guys just looked and went, my brother's gay. And that just ended it. So I'd ask you to do that. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs>